I said uh, at the beginning of my chat with you this, this afternoon that there's two issues I wanted to raise with you. And I haven't raised the second one yet, so <laughs> the first one took a while to, to raise. And so what I'd like to do is raise the second one with you. <clears throat> yesterday, um, when I began talking yesterday at the beginning, when somebody asked the question of what's happening with regard to uh, learning centres and where's the best and most appropriate place to place a learning centre and all those kind of things. Um, and I started referring to earth changes in Europe. And I started referring to earth changes in Europe and uh, there's no way to fasten it really. Um, what, what happened was that uh, the majority of you went, who were from Europe <laughs> went into a lot of fear. All right? So I'll just uh, tape, tape this one up. Can't come down. And it's interesting what happens when we go into fear. What happens is as soon as you're going to fear that you don't want to feel, spirit straight away start shutting everything down. And you could feel yesterday at the beginning how strongly you felt like, oh, I don't, oh, I don't really want to hear this conversation. How, how much most of you went away from the conversation emotionally. And that causes then the spirits to even... So, there's a, in, a, in other words, there's a stepping away from yourself in that place and that causes spirits to have more influence and then you step away more and then the spirits have more influence and, and slowly it gets to the point where actually now I feel like oh, my throat's starting to hurt because really nobody wants to hear anything that's being said. Now, there's Europe, a Greek map of Europe that... Uh, Nico brought today for us and I want to start addressing some of these fears with you. Is that alright? Because, because the reality is that uh, unless we deal with fear, we are going to be controlled by our fear for the rest of our existence. I don't just mean your rest of your life on earth, I mean the rest of your existence. Because as soon as you pass in the spirit world, you will have lost one fear and that is probably the fear of death. But, but none of the other fears that you have will, uh, will ever be dealt with still. So, so the reality is the faster and the more we can confront our fears and start to process them and deal with them, the better off our life is going to be while we're on earth. But it's also going to be much better when we arrive in the spirit world. You'll have far more ability to investigate truth when you arrive in the spirit world in a fearless state than if you arrive in the spirit world with all this fear still inside of us. So we want to start ad addressing fear in, in reality. Now, first, of course, is the fear of death. Now, many of us feel we don't have the fear of death, but I put to you that uh, the majority of us do have a fear of death, particularly a painful death. Right? In particular, a painful death. So... so there, there is also a lot of fear about sexual matters, sexual fear. This is the fear of being raped or the fear of being abused or the fear of being harmed by aggressive and violent people, right? And for many women, it's a, they're afraid of being harmed by aggressive, violent men. And for many men, they're not very harmed of being, afraid of being sexually harmed by a, an aggressive or violent woman um, because that's often not what happens and the man is often strong enough to repel such a thing. So, so there's also that fear and that fear is dominant in, in the female gender. There's also the fears of what will happen to my family. Many of you are more afraid of your families that, uh, and what will happen to them than you are of yourself even. So you're more afraid of your children being hurt than you are of you being hurt. You're more afraid of your children passing than you are of you passing. You're more, so we have a lot of investment, family investment in our children in particular, in their survival or in their happiness even. And we often, the reason why we're often like that is because as parents we're often heavily um, invested in our children being happy because we see our happiness as their, or their happiness as our happiness, basically. 
So there's huge investments there. Now, all of these investments affect how we see the earth change situation, you see? Because the reality is many of us would be very interested in investigating fully with spirits and with other people and with scientists and everything else the truth about the earth and how it works and the changes that happen to it on a periodic basis. We'd be very inv interested in investigating all of those things if it weren't for, for the fears that we have about such things. Now, the main reason why truth is not easily available on the planet is because of our fear. Fear automatically rejects truth. This is a basic thing we need to understand about our fear. When we're in an emotional state of fear, we are automatically in the state also of rejecting truth. Now, for some of us, it's a fear of how we feel about ourselves. So we're automatically in a state of rejecting the truth about ourselves. Does that make sense? In other words, if we have a mirror there and we could see our spirit body in the mirror, we don't want to see. We, we go up there and we want to see this physical body and even then half the time we don't want to see that, do we? We don't want to see what is happening to it because we're growing older and, and all sorts of things are happening to us. And so we don't even want to see the truth of what's happening to us physically, let alone what's happening to our spirit body as we make choices and decisions. And then <clears throat> we definitely don't want to see what's happening to the people around us as well, particularly if they are our children. A lot of times we have no desire to see the truth about their own con their condition and what's happening to them. And as a result, with, with regard to the earth, we also have these strong feelings as we want to believe the earth is going to stay as it is, at least for all of my own existence. That's what, what we generally want to believe. We don't want to see major changes that have a huge impact on my life happening in my lifetime, unless those impacts are more comfort, more security, more safety, you know, and all those kind of things. We don't really want to see them. And so we have this uh, desire to avoid the truth of what is happening. And, and we become like an ostrich burying the head, its head in the sand because it doesn't want to know what's going on around it. Right? And I think that's just a fable anyway, but um, I don't know if anybody's actually seen an ostrich with its head buried in the sand, but it's just a, a, a saying sort of thing. Now, let's look at what's happening politically in your region and economically in your region. But let's do it without the fear and just be honest about what's happening. Right? There's different countries through here in Europe, yes? How many of them are bankrupt? How many? Do you know which ones are bankrupt? Mike, you're involved with the... In Rio. In Rio. Well, well, let's go for what they're telling us first. Do you want to grab the mic from... Uh, if you could just take a mic up to, up to Mike. And, uh, Hello. Hello. Um, I guess so I in, rea in reality, which in ones reality, are bankrupt? In reality, I mean, you've got... Obviously, Greece is in a lot of trouble at the moment. Right, so Greece, yeah. Um, staying near there, you've got Portugal. Portugal. Spain Spain. Well. Ireland. Ireland. So those are the, the sort of key. Iceland. Iceland, which is... Up the app. Yeah, so that's kind of what's more in the news. Okay. Now, the ones that are not in the news, Mike, that you're aware well, of... Well, I mean, I'd say that the UK was bankrupt. Right. Um, I haven't looked into France. But, yep. um, but pretty much, I mean... So what about... These countries through here, Croatia, Slovenia, pretty much the same. Yeah. So, so we've got huge numbers of country now in the, in the European Union in, on the verge of bankruptcy or bankrupt. The United States of America as well. Of course, yeah. The biggest economy in the world is pretty much there, isn't it? Just hasn't been declared as well, such. It's basically anything that keeps everything afloat is confidence, isn't it? Or belief in the press that things aren't that bad. If you actually look at the reality of it, the actual by the way the economies are run, they're all bankrupt. Exactly. So let's look at that as, a, as one thing for a start. How is it that all of us believe that we're all secure monetarily, most of us do believe that, and yet, and yet most of the countries are in so much debt that if we were in that much debt, we'd be in a panic. So how, how did that happen? It happened because we do not want to see the truth. 
that how, that's how it happens. We're, we want to maintain confidence in a system that, that is proving that there is no confidence in it. And yet we want to maintain confidence. The irony is while we maintain the confidence, it keeps it alive, but, but it's still going to get worse because it's still being run in exactly the same manner. Agreed? And yet we want to bury our head in the sand. How many of you feel safe when you have 100,000 euros in the bank? Would you feel safe then? Well, I wouldn't feel safe then because the reality is that a lot of the economies <laughs> here are bankrupt and sooner or later it's going to have an effect of my, at, at my bank. Why would you feel safe? And then you go, all right, I'll take my euros out of the bank and put it under my pillow, right? Well, the problem is with the type of things that happen that during a collapse is we have huge inflation generally and all of a sudden something's 100,000 euros becomes... 5,000 euros in terms of its value. So is that safe? Not really. So really we aren't safe financially, are we? Are we? No, we're not safe financially, right? Okay, how does that feel? Can you see most of us want to avoid the feeling of that? While we believe we've got the security, we want to avoid the feeling that we're not safe financially. And, and this is why the world isn't telling you, the, these leaders of these countries are not telling you the truth. The reality is you don't want to know the truth. Can you see? We don't want to know the truth. Collectively, we don't want to know the truth. You, who of you have seen The Matrix? Yeah, a lot of you. You know that it's the red blue, pill, blue pill thing. <laughs> if you wanted to know the truth, no matter how bad it was, would you take the pill? You see, most of us don't, don't. Most of us don't want to take the pill. Most of us don't want to see the truth no matter how bad it is. Mind you, I feel the truth is quite good, but uh, you know, the truth of the earth and the said, economic condition is not very good. Okay, let's look at the environmental position of the earth. Who of you have investigated much about the environmental position of the earth? A few of you? Any, any of you done that? Yeah. What, what do you find? Like, how much fish is u used out of the sea? Do you, do you have any idea? There's huge amounts, isn't there, of, of meat comes from the sea. Right? Do you know what they're having to do now to get that fish? Yeah. fish well, beside, they have to do fish farms, yep, and, and seed them and do all this stuff. Or they have big trawlers, two or three trawlers, with a large net that goes for kilometres generally in between, and they drag the whole sea just to get a feed of fish. Right? And uh, none of us really want to know, uh, those people who eat the fish don't really want to know that that's what's happening. The fish stocks are being decimated in a lot of locations on the planet, yes? And, and we don't want to know because it's under the sea. But it's environmentally having some damage. What about uh, how many of us are interested in what happens with our power generation? Well, we're interested from a consumer perspective, I'm sure, like I said yesterday. But how interested are we in terms of the damage that it does to the world? The coal, the search for coal, the search for uranium, even so-called green energy such as wind and solar, what actually goes into producing these forms of energy is huge amounts of energy, right? And uh, the reality is none of them are really sustainable. In fact, nuclear power is more sustainable than almost any other power at the moment, if you look at sustainability in terms of its impact on the environment, in terms of what gets taken from the environment. I'm not saying it's sustainable in terms of what goes back into the environment as its waste, but, but it's, 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 it, it's even more sustainable than many of the other forms of energy that we're using. We don't want to see the damage that's being done to the, our own air quality, the, the, the air we breathe. We don't want to see the damage to the water systems. And why do we need now water filtration plants? Because the, the natural filtration plants of the earth be, are becoming more and more polluted because of how we, how we search for fuel. We don't want to see that. So what do we do? We bury our head in that, in, that, in that as well. We don't look at that either. 
And I feel the earth change issues is just another one of those issues. We just don't want to see it. See it. Right? it it's going to just leave it on. Hello. Yeah. I was just going to say another thing that people there's been like a bit of a bugbear for me recently is the I don't know if you get them in Greece, but like the chemical trails that get dropped off the planes. They got sorry. Chem trails. Chem it's, trails. Yeah. It's basically the <coughs> government have said it's been, there's been BBC documentaries about it. They're basically putting aluminium, bromide, all these sort of things into the atmosphere. One argument is sort of weather control, one's to stop global warming. And people sit there and everyone looks at it and complains and there's all these clips on YouTube, but nobody does a thing about it. And you try and talk to people about it and they're like, no, it's a vapour trail or something like that. Yeah. But they've put their hands up and said, we are trying to modify the climate, we're trying to modify your health through this. It's all documented. Yeah. And people just ignore it because yeah. they don't want it to be true. Yeah. Yeah. And how, what about what happens with the seed supply at the moment? How many of us don't want to know what's going on there? It's like, in some places of the world now, it's illegal to plant your own backyard garden. <laughs> Can you believe that? That produces food. It's actually illegal in some parts of the world now to do that. Large companies, which are genetically modifying seed, want to make sure that they have control of the world's seed supply. So that's happening at the moment too. So can you see this earth change issue is, is really in a way almost a minor issue in comparison with all of the different things that are happening on the earth right at the moment that we're mostly burying our head in the sands about because we don't, we don't feel we can do anything about it personally. And so we bury our head in the sand and we just hope that it's all going to go away. And in fact, we try to make out and live our life like it's not even really happening. That's what we try to do. Now, I suggest to you that exactly the same fear that drives that desire to get away from what's happening in the world right at the moment is exactly the same fear that is the cause of you not wanting to know what's going to happen to Europe in the coming years. Do you, do you understand? It's exactly the same fear. The fear that drives the desire to keep your head in the sand about economy Head in the sand about the environment, head in the sand about the political system, head in the sand about what's happening all through the energy system and the pharmaceutical system and every other system on this planet. All of those same feelings that you have of wanting to avoid what's really going on in all of those areas is the same reason why you want to avoid this one. And the irony is that this one partially is the result of our avoidance of all the other things. What's happening with this one is the result of our avoidance. So, what can we do about that? What do you feel we can do about that? Well, obviously, we've got to start feeling our fears. We, how do you start feeling your fears? You start by doing one thing. It's a real basic thing. You tell yourself... And everyone else the truth. That's how you feel your fears. You know what we do? Most of the time we even avoid telling ourselves the truth. And that helps us skip over a lot of our fears, our personal fears and whatever. But more importantly... Even when we do this, telling ourselves the truth, we generally skip over the and everyone else part. Right? So we're happy to tell ourselves the truth and change maybe a bit of our life, but we're not happy to tell other people the truth. Now, when you start telling other people the truth, sooner or later, if you do it from a place of love, sooner or later people will start listening to you. But, but what do they normally go through as a cycle when they listen? Well, they're not happy when you tell them the truth. So their first emotion is anger. And so this is why we're avoiding telling other people the truth, see? Because we want to avoid their anger. This is why most people don't want to know about earth changes because anybody who starts talking about them generally is ridiculed, laughed at, and you know anybody, that none of the scientific community 
all, all of the scientific community basically have decried any earth change thing that's going on at the moment. They've basically dismissed all of it. There's plenty of evidence, if you look at the individual evidence in different systems on the planet, that, that things are happening, but everyone wants to avoid because nobody wants to tell everyone else the truth. Governments spend half their life not telling you the truth. You know, every government on the planet has a secret archives, secret files. Almost all governments on the planet have secret police, even, with a whole heap of what we call, like what we often relate to as espionage type things, but they're all secret files, secrets that are kept from you, the public. Why do they do that? Because you don't want to know the truth. Because you'd be up in arms if you heard the truth. You see? And so we've got to start loving the truth rather than being up in arms every time we hear truth. Do you, do you see that? If we love the truth, then the truth will come to us. If we love the truth, then we won't get up in arms about hearing this truth or that truth. We won't get all upset about hearing the truth. Does that make sense to everyone? If we love the truth, we'll automatically have a soul-based openness towards hearing it. When we have a soul-based openness towards hearing truth, that's when truth can enter us. Right. Now I suggest to you that a soul-based openness towards earth changes is the only thing that's going to give you the truth about earth changes. Right. That's the only thing. And the reason why we don't want to know is because half the time we don't even want to tell ourselves what's going to go on and then the other half of the time we definitely don't want to tell <laughs> anybody else what's going on. Because the people who tell other people generally get laughed at, ridiculed, or even worse. That's what normally happens. All right. So, let's now address this issue. If I was going to set up a learning centre in Europe, I can tell you exactly where I would set it up. <laughs> in Greece, you reckon? Well, let me tell you the truth about Greece. Do you want to hear the truth about Greece? You see all of these mountain ranges through here and all of these mountain ranges that go through here and all of those mountain ranges that go through there, they are there because of a compression zone. So that goes from the, the top through here, the top of, this is, this is what, uh, this is Tur Turkey is through here, isn't it? So through Turkey, through Greece, through Italy, and the southern Alps and through the Alps of Spain and southern France, Pyrenees. the Pyrenees. So, so all the way through there, there is the zone. It's the second most active seismic zone in the world. Right? The first most active seismic zone is the Pacific Ring of Fire. The second most active zone is this zone through there. That's a compression zone. In other words, any seismic activity that occurs in your region in Europe is all going to happen due to the compression of the African continent moving upwards towards the Eurasian continent or the European continent, right? And, and as the African continent moves up, you get a compression all the way through where the land is subducting, where it's going underneath. And as a result of that, this is the most volcanically active zone in your region and it is also the most seismically earthquake-prone zone in the region. So does it sound to you like Greece is going to be uh, the best place to be if this compression continues? Not really, does it? No. Can you see that? Where would be the best place to be, do you think? On the, on the moon. <laughs> there's, there's no atmosphere to breathe on the moon. <laughs> Not good for you. Scandinavia? Scandinavia? Yes. yes. Those from Scandinavia want to say that. <laughs> where, where is there no compression zones? Obviously, if you look at the map. In this area here, isn't it? Can you see that? There's no compression zones in those areas. Of course, this area here is from Germany across, isn't it? And then as you come across into Russia, obviously there's less compression until you get to this 
fault here, which is another compression zone. Right? Now, all through this area is relatively flat in comparison with the other locations because the, these are the seismic areas that are the places where things compress. So if I was going to build a place that I wanted to be a learning centre, I certainly wouldn't be focusing somewhere around here or here or here, anywhere through here. Just from a point of practicality, right? And I haven't even discussed what's going to happen with water events and how, what supervolcanoes might erupt or any of those things. All I've done is discuss just the practicalities of where the compression is going to occur. Right? Okay, so where I would choose is probably right up here, just in there, which is on the border between Finland and Sweden. Yeah? Yes, I know, because it's almost in the Arctic. It is on the exactly. Yeah, completely dark for a month, and then then it gets completely light for another yeah. month of the ultras at end. Yes, yeah. no worries. Exactly. Th there's the Arctic uh, track yeah. there. So, due to the due to the Earth being on a twenty-two and a half degree <coughs> uh, axis. Of course, part of it is going to, at any one point in time, be dark at the tops and the bottoms, at the poles, right? So that area. And yet I would still choose there. Well, is it going to shift? Well, what Katarina just said is it's going to shift, right? <laughs> in other... Sorry? Eventually light is going to come. Well, you don't know that for certain, though, do you? No, okay. So... So why say that? You're hoping that that's the case. <laughs> yeah. You see, you see, most of the time, um, what we do is we don't follow our feelings. What we do is we follow logic in most of our choices and decisions. Now, what I'm suggesting to you is you need to have a mixture of logic and feelings. You can't just have feelings by themselves because often the feelings are distorted by errors and therefore will be inaccurate. But you can't just have logic by itself either because logic doesn't usually... Usually we're flawed in our logic. We don't include all things in our logic. For example, what we often do when we're looking at the earth and we're looking at where's the place to live and what, what do we want to do, what passions do we have, my feelings are, along those lines, are, I know there are many millions of spiritual people in Russia. I know that as you get into more and more into Western Europe, the spirituality declines because everyone is more capitalistic. Everyone is more focused on their day-to-day -day life in terms of money, less focused in terms of God, right? As you progress this direction, there's less focus on money because they don't have as much money. Their economies are quite poor and therefore they are more focused on developing other things and many of them are much more connected with nature as a result. Generally, a connection with nature results in a more spiritual environment, right? So I'm feeling about all the people in this region and I'm going, hmm, these are people who are going to be ready to hear truth at some point soon in the, fu in the future. It would make sense to me to have a place somewhere through here, right, that, that would be a learning centre so that those people at some point can be attracted to that place and learn about the truth. That's my desire. Um, and all I do is feel that desire and go, I look at the people and feel the desire and I go, yeah, that sounds good. And then I know a bit, if I know a bit about you know, where the zones are and where the changes might occur, I go, surely that would make sense to place a learning centre where the people who are probably more open to learning are going to be than it is to place a learning centre where people are very close to learning about divine truth. Right? So that's where I would focus my attention, in that region there. In that region there. And this covers a large region, does it not? You're looking, the Black Sea is there, you've got Georgia here, and then you've got all north of that, the mountains, and then you've got north of that, all west of these mountains here. They're called the Ur are they the Urals? The what? Euralia, the Urals, yeah. And then, and then, you know, anywhere from here across, 
obviously this area here is, is automatically interesting, I feel. That's my personal opinion. But just imagine for a moment that what I said yesterday is true. In a, and what I said yesterday is that around Naples, there is a supervolcano. And there are three points here on the border uh, between France and Italy, and here on the border between Italy and... Croatia. Sorry? Croatia. Slovenia. That's it, Slovenia. Um, between the, there, there are points of major tectonic... Uh, stress and these are the areas that the spirits have indicated at, at this point that would eventually something would happen to now if something does happen there and we have major volcanic eruptions can you see this whole region here is going to be severely affected by those things by those events can you see that now the earth also rotates at the moment in this direction does it not so so this is the east this is the west, yes? So as the earth rotates eastward, anything that's spewing out will automatically go just west, will it not? And the only thing stopping that is the weather-based systems that come in from the Atlantic, yep, which come in usually, don't they, from your northwest. Yep. And that's the only thing stopping the flow of that ash and dust that will come out of these things. So you can see that in time, all of this region here, a lot of this region, unless we have some major blows pulling them back in the other direction, all of this region is potentially going to be covered in ash at least. Yes? If these volcanoes do erupt. If you've got this continent moving up that way, a lot of the area all the way through here may subduct actually, may actually go underneath the... European plate go underneath the plate so we may have large land masses in Europe completely disappearing and going underground under the ground yeah uh, Joy do you want to just if we have a microphone over there yep. AJ what causes um, the continent to move up you were just saying that the continent there would move up and um, what causes a continent to move up Um, there are many causes, uh, Joy, at the moment. Now, if you're asking what are the scientific causes of a continent moving up as geophysicists uh, and geologists describe today, that's a different question to what actually causes all co continents to move historically. Does that make sense? There are two completely different questions. Because mankind... So it's OK, Katerina. You don't need to hold it. Because um, the, the reality is that mankind doesn't know all the reasons why things happen. Right? We don't even know all the reasons why something happens in our own body, let alone on the planet. Right? So the reality is that there are varying reasons why continents move. Now at the moment, if you drew a map of the world, you've basically got the big Pacific plate. And then you've got, so you've got Australia down here, uh, uh, like so. And then you've got the other, this, this zone, this line through here, coming from Australia up through Turkey, up through the Himalayas firstly, down through Turkey and through Europe. They're the two major zones of subduction on the planet. Does that make sense? So as, as um, there are what is called uh, continental... Um, mountains that produce more land on or more of the earth's crust and they occur in the pacific and they also occur in the atlantic and so the the land land is coming from underneath the earth and up to the surface through volcanic activity and then the the plates move and as they move the direction in which they move determines what happens at the point of subduction so everything here is moving in that direction and mankind doesn't really even really understand why at this point, why it's moving, but they know it is. For example, I think the Pacific Plate at the moment moves about two and a half centimetres a year. You're talking a 40,000 kilometre ring here, that's 40,000 kilometres long, of subduction zone 
moving at two and a, two and a bit centimetres a year. Not very much, just, just an inch, very small. Um, actually, I think the Pacific one might be about six centimetres, but parts of it are two and a half centimetres. It depends on how the zone works, because there are parts of it that are going in that direction and that direction, and some of them move longer than others. So you've got this movement occurring, just naturally occurring on the Earth already. That's what causes all of our seismic activity. But you notice lately we've had a lot more seismic activity. Have you noticed that? A good last year, well it really it's been the last 10 years, uh, there's been a lot more seismic activity than normal. And in fact, all the way through different points of this, there are now volcanoes, small volcanoes, when I say small, they are volcanoes that are under a VEI, uh, V-I-E, it is, a volcano, explosive, no, it is EI, index of less than five. Now, the volcano explosive index is like the, uh, the Richter scale in, in uh, earthquakes in that each scale is 100 times, uh, sorry, is 10 times bigger in intensity, but a thousand times bigger in energy release. So it's, so it's ten times the intensity, a thousand times the energy release. Um, so a volcanic index of five is what the average volcano is less than at the moment on the planet. Um, Mount St Helens, you remember that? Um, went off in 1980? Was it 80? Um, it had a volcano explosive index of five. The supervolcano, if, if, if it goes off in, the, in Italy, has a volcano explosive index of eight. Right. So that just gives you an idea of what you're dealing with. Now, this process of this earth crustal movement, like I said, just happens naturally. It's a natural process of replenishing the earth, replenishing the soil, and replenishing in terms of providing energy, it does provide a lot of things to the Earth's systems. If you look at the most productive areas on the Earth in terms of food production, where are they? They're usually where there's been volcanoes in the past. Right? So volcanic soil is usually the most productive and mineral-rich soil. So it's a natural process that's a good process for the Earth. The problem we face is what's coming up is a combination of a lot of things. Like I mentioned yesterday, it's a combination of the love of God permeating the universe to greater intensities, plus the fact that we're going through some galactic cycles. And as a result of that, there will be pressure on the Earth in a lot of these different places where at the moment the pressure is increasingly intens is intensifying. And you can see already where that is. But what's happened in the last, say, you, you think of the last year to two years. Where, what have you heard of in your own news? You've heard of Japan. What happened there? Very large earthquake. One of the largest earthquakes that I've ever had. Yeah? Of a, of a nine on the Richter scale. Yes? So, and what happened after that? Tsunamis. Have they yet determined the, how many people died from that? I don't know if they have, but... Um, all the way through above Japan in, in Russia, there is a whole series in this area here, there's a whole series of volcanoes that have erupted. Around five or six of them have erupted that have been dormant for some time. Then you've got the Aleutian Islands, which are the Alaskan Islands coming across the top of the zone. There's volcanoes erupting in that area. Right. Where else have we heard from the news in the last in the last six months? New Zealand, New Zealand the bottom of the zone. We also heard of Iceland, but that's in the Atlantic zone. Yeah. Chile, which is still in this zone. Remember, there's a volcano that's gone off in Chile just a few weeks ago. Papua New Guinea just had an earthquake two days, three days ago. Six point six on the Richter scale. This one here was a. I think it was 6.6 .6 or 6.8, something like that. Can you see all of these places are all around that rim? So there's obviously something going on with the rim, isn't there? With the Pacific Rim. Obviously something happening. 
Now, that plate is the largest plate that doesn't have land mass on the planet. When I say it, it's all underwater. It's very, very hard. Most of it's very, very hard to measure what's going on with it, let alone work out what's happening underneath the sea. About uh, eight months ago, I think it was, NASA put out a, uh, uh, something from their site where they said in between the New Zealand Islands and Fiji Islands, and Fiji is over here somewhere, in between the New Zealand and Fiji Islands, they had the sea level raised 600 feet in a space of a few months. The sea floor. Sorry, the sea floor, not the sea level. The sea floor raised 600 feet. It caused so much of a stink that they removed it from their website the next day. Why did they remove it? Because people don't want to know the truth. They're afraid, you see. When people get afraid, they, their whole website gets hit with millions of hits, shuts down their whole systems. So, of course, best to remove the offending piece of truth. Can you see? But the sea floor is actually raising in the Pacific. Mm. Uh, you need to. They discovered it or they did something that caused it? No, no, they've measured it. They've discovered it. Yeah. So they had like a measurement from before and... Oh, no, they have actually instruments all across the floor. You see, there's, there's transatlantic cables going across different areas, joining parts of the countries together, all the countries together, you see. And to protect those cables, they put in measuring instruments to, 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 look, to know what's going on with the Earth floor. The measuring instruments, some of them are at eight, like six... Some of them are, like the Pacific's like average depth, I think it's about four and a half thousand metres, four, four and a half kilometres deep, the average depth. There are places of it that are nearly 10,000 kilometres deep or 8,000 kilometres deep. And that's a lot of water, isn't it? It's almost one third of the surface of the earth um, covered with water four and a half kilometres deep. Very, very hard to measure what's going on under the ground four th under the sea 4,000, uh, four kilometres deep, 4,000 metres deep. And so they put these sensors in and these sensors send signals to measuring stations in the different places around the earth to keep track of what's going on because they don't want their subterranean cables to break because that causes interruption of all communications. So regularly different scientific agencies measure all of these things. Now, what causes most of our weather, do you know? Do you know what causes most of our weather? Uh, we need microphones, so who knows? Is it something to do with the temperature of the water on the planet? Uh, there's a lot to do with the temperature of the water of the planet, but what determines the temperature of the water on the planet? The sun. Right, so the sun is the major cause of our weather. Anything that happens to the sun is worth knowing about because if we know about what's happening to the sun, we can at least predict what might happen to the earth as a result in the weather systems. Well, do you know what has happened recently? Well, you know what I think the most significant thing that's happened, that's happened recently? That... The, that the USA, which had, I think, seven major satellites pointing at the sun to measure it, has closed down five of them. Now, why would a government that knows that the major impact upon the Earth's weather systems and other systems on the Earth is the sun, close down five of its monitoring stations for the sun because we don't want the truth <laughs> spot on exactly that is exactly the reason why we don't want the truth we're not willing even to spend money on the truth we don't want to know the truth we don't want as a, as governments we don't even want to spend money on truth does that make sense and this probably <laughs> Good law of attraction for us. It sounds like it might be a permanent addition to our life as well. 
So we might just need to close those windows. So the main reason why these events happen is because nobody on earth really wants to know the truth. We don't want to know what's going on with our earth even. We want, we want to be like bury our head in the sand so, so, so that we don't have to worry about it. Why? Because our, our inside of us there is so much fear that anything that potentially upsets our life, we don't want to know about. We just want to remain blind to it. Right? Did you know that in 2003, NASA had, had a picture on their website for 10 days? And the picture on their website was a picture of a very large object the size of Jupiter intercepting between the sun and the earth. That, they had it on there for 10 days. It's a picture that was on the NASA website. It was taken by one of those sun monitoring stations that we were talking about facing towards the sun. They removed it after 10 days. So they, they wanted to tell everyone the truth, but when, once everyone gets upset about the truth, what happens? It's best just to leave them closed, guys. Can you close both? Yeah. Thank you. When we're sure that they've stopped, we'll <laughs> open them up again. Can you see how much we don't want to hear? Like we create a law of attraction event like that. You know, it's interesting when we uh, sit down, myself and Mary, and talk to mothers with their, with their children around. Because anything they don't want to hear, <laughs> their children come and interrupt them. Does that make sense? It happens every time. Every time there's a subject you don't want to hear, the children will come and interrupt you. I've seen this happen so many thousands of times, it's just amusing now to watch. Any subject that you don't want to hear, you will create around you reasons to not hear. Yep. And it's very interesting how it happens even with our own children. We just don't want to hear so much that they just come and interrupt and interrupt again and interrupt again and... And that's just telling us we don't want to hear anything about that subject. And in my opinion, that's telling you that's a very important subject for you to begin addressing emotionally. I feel this earth change subject is not important in itself, but it's important because of the fear that it creates in us. Do, do you see that? And the fear is so strong in most people about this subject that most people have a deep loathing of the subject. As a result, they don't want to know what's going on. We don't even want to know the natural systems of the earth that happen regularly, let alone know the ones that will happen tumultuously, the ones that will happen all of a sudden. There is evidence, although the scientists would disagree with me, there is evidence that the earth goes through cataclysmic change at times. In particular, there's evidence uh, from a scientific perspective regarding what happened to animals on the planet. We have cycles of large extinction events of certain types of animals throughout history on the planet. We have also uh, cycles of planets being, th uh, sorry, of animals being, s we have proof of animals being snap frozen within moments while they still are eating vegetation they get snap frozen and then covered in ice now those events are definitely proven on the planet now scientists still have not come up with satisfactory answers as to why these events occur and my suggestion is that they haven't come up with satisfactory answers because we don't want to know the answer does that make sense we're too afraid to know the answers that's why none of this happens, you see. We, we've got to start giving up our fear about knowing the answers or knowing the truth. We've got to give up our fear about knowing the truth about ourselves and give up the fear about knowing the truth about our external environment. 
And we've got to start feeling our desires. Now, the truth is you cannot feel desires while you have so much fear. It's hard to feel desires while fear is present. You try that. You, you allow yourself to get triggered by a movie. Like, let's say you watch a movie. Many of you are afraid of spirits. So let's say you watched a movie like something like, I don't know, The Exorcism of Emily Rose. You might have heard of that movie. Um, just something like that, that, that is quite fearful if we're afraid of spirits. Now, you try feeling your desires while you're watching it. <laughs> Most people just say, you know, and there's no desire at all. No desire for food, no desire for anything. And, and, uh, and usually afterwards, then the desire for food kicks in, you know, like, you know, <laughs> stuff, down that, stuff down that fear is the way we go. And, and this is the way we have got to cope with the stresses of fear on our planet. We use food, alcohol, cigarettes and drugs. And, well, yeah, caffeine, <laughs> shall we say, and a way to avoid as much as we can possibly avoid over our own fear. That's what we do. And, and we're there complaining, and uh, many people on the earth at, uh, at times complain about the fact that governments don't tell us the truth. And I put to you that governments don't tell us the truth because we don't want to know the truth. <laughs> When we find out the truth, we're going to be so annoyed with the governments that they're going to lose their power. Now, what government in its right mind would give you truth that it know then will cause it to lose its power? It's only going to give you truth when, they, when everybody says, oh, we're going to keep you in government even though you've lied to us in the past. Then we have a chance of hearing the truth from that government, do we not? But what do we want to do? On the planet, we also have this other thing going on. It's called retribution. where we want to take vengeance upon the people who have told us lies. Right? We get so upset and angry that we've been told a series of lies that we, all we want to do is punish the person who's done it. So you try, you try, you'll see this if you investigate this on the planet. Any person who's ever told the truth after they've lied to you always finishes up getting punished. Except for Bill Clinton. Except for Bill Clinton. <laughs> I don't know about that. I think he got pretty punished, didn't he? He got day after day after day after day after day after day of embarrassing talk, talking about him for years and he still gets it. Like he's still getting it after he's left power even. So I don't know. I'd, I'd call that retribution, wouldn't you? So, so the reality is that most of us have a strong desire to punish people who have done the wrong thing. And as a result of that desire, it's highly unlikely that those people will ever confess to what they've done. Can you see? Would you confess to something you've done if you knew you were going to be punished for what you have done? Well, it's human. It's unfortunately, one of, our, one of the main human injuries that we don't. We don't have that much of a love of truth, unfortunately. And so we can't expect our governments to confess to what they've done, can we? If we have that attitude ourselves, that we're not going to confess to what we've done, how can we expect our governments to confess to what they've done or other people to confess to what they've done? And the reality is, I feel that one of the things about all of this stuff about earth changes that affect Europe or all the rest of the world is that we don't want to know the truth. We don't want to see what evidence is out there because we are so afraid to know what the truth is because it might mean that my life has to change. And I put to you that if none of us had any fear right now, if, if all of us on the planet had no fear, every single person on the planet would know what is going to happen in the future. And we would already be living in the places that would be the most safe right now. And the only reason why that's not the case is because we all have fear. We all have fear of the truth. We all have fear of knowing what the truth is. And we all have fear of changing our lives to suit that truth. 
The reality is we want to rebel against God's truth constantly. We want to rebel against the absolute truth. We, we want God's truth to conform to what I want it to be. We don't want to conform to what God's truth is. We want God's truth to conform to what we want it to be. The only problem with that is there's six and a half billion people on the planet who all have a different opinion about what that truth should be. So the likelihood of that happening is pretty remote, isn't it? My suggestion is one of the first things we need to deal with over the next few months if we really want to progress ourselves towards God is to deal with our fear of the truth. Our fear of our personal truth, what we look like and currently are and the emotions that are within us and our fear of the external truth. What is going to happen to our earth and our environment and where we're going to live and all those things. We need to deal with those two fears. If we deal with those two fears, we will be inspired to do lots of things with our desires. But desire and fear do not coexist. When you desire something, your desire will be squashed as soon as you feel a fear my suggestion is to feel it as rapidly as possible and release it from you rather than living in it and not feeling it and therefore your desire then just remains stagnant and doesn't progress. Does that make sense? Instead of doing that, if you desire something and you get to a point where you're afraid, if you feel your fear and release your fear from your soul, then you are free to continue the desire. Just say that into the mic for me because it's very true. <laughs> Why is it so difficult? Because we are so afraid as a human race. That's why it's so difficult. We are just so afraid. The, the biggest problem we face is our fear. No, earth changes are minor compared to our fear. The fear, the fear is the worst possible problem we have on the planet. It, it, it causes all other things. It causes all of our pain as well. It's just a terrible effect on us, our fear. And we are even afraid of our own fear. We, we, we've become such locked up in this cycle that we're even afraid to feel fear. We, we believe it's an emotion that we cannot feel. We have this, how many of you believe your terror is impossible to feel? You just stay in it once you've been. Many more of you than that, trust me. Because it, it's like... You, you, what's happening is for most of us is we have the fear and then we have our fear of our fear. <laughs> right? That's how locked up we are with fear. And this is why the human race gets very angry because we have so much fear we don't want to, we're afraid of feeling that we get angry instead. We, we try to become powerful by being angry rather than feeling this fear. And I could probably list quite a few hundred emotional reasons why we're afraid of our fear. Like, and they all go back to our childhoods. All of the reasons why we're afraid of fear go back to childhood. You think of what, if you're a child, where did most of your fear come from? Can you, you think about it? The grown-ups around you, yes? So they are big, big people, probably parents, but also others, big people. And what are they like? What are those grown-ups like? So... This is the child's perspective of the grown-up. What do the grown-ups look like? You cast your back, you, you cast your mind back to your own childhood. When were you afraid? You cast your mind back to the times you were afraid. What was going on? You, you, you anger. So it's not, it's not like just a little friend of yours being angry, was it? It was this person like eight times your size or more in a rage, often in a spirit-induced rage, because you sometimes see their eyes change and their whole face almost change, didn't you? Many of you saw that as when you were children. So you've got this rage coming out. And as, along with the anger is the feeling of... right coming out of them towards this little child. Of course the child is going to be terrified, isn't it? And then when the child starts shaking, 
What does the angry, violent parent say? Stop crying. But they don't just say, oh, poor person, you know, poor kid being scared. Stop crying. What do they say? They're even more angry and violent, projecting at the child, yes, and saying, if you don't shut up, I'll give you something to be afraid of, you know, and then they're into, and they actually then perpetrate violence. Like the child now is getting physically abused. The child is getting actually attacked physically. And in fact, if that adult attacked another adult physically like that, the adult would be put in jail or at least, or at least um, accused of assault by the government, would they not? And yet, because it's the child, the child, the, the, the adult doesn't get accused of assault, do does does they? No. So in other words, the child learns that it is totally unprotected from even the people who love it. Even the people who love it don't protect it. In fact, they are often angry and violent with the child. And they realise they have no external form of protection at all. Now, every, almost every one of us has been through this at some point in our childhood. Now, is it any wonder why we have so much trouble feeling fear? Just from that one reason. It makes sense, doesn't it? Um, I used to be told that... Just wait that for a sec. Is there a mic on? Yeah. Oh. I used to be told that it was, uh, all my fears are in my imagination, that... I'm making them up. Right, yeah. That is in my mind and yeah. they're not real. Well, the, the reality is in your childhood, they were all real. All of, pretty much all of your fears were real in your childhood or they were your parents' fears, one of the two. You would never have any fear otherwise. But the reality is when we get to be a grown-up ourselves, then we're told, that never happened. I wasn't like that. I loved you. Oh, we did our best. You know, they told all these messages that then cause us to detune from our fears rather than feel them. Right? Now, these are just the fears to do with our personal pain. What about the fears associated with our emotional pain? How much are they ignored? Well, they're even ignored even more. Like that, it's totally denied that, we're, that our parents generally ever caused any emotional pain. So we have all this fear of physical pain. We have all this fear of emotional pain all just inside of us, stored there. And so now somebody comes along and says, oh, I want to tell you the truth about your emotional pain. We've got so much fear stored in there, but what do I do with it? What, how am I going to work through that? What, what am I going to do with that information? And then like, how does that benefit me? It doesn't benefit me. I just want to stay away from it. And so we want to bury our head in the sand as to our own emotional pain, our own physical pain, and therefore, by, by extension, we're going to bury our head in the sand about global pain, about the pain of the world, the suffering of the world, if you like. And that desire of ourselves to bury our head in the sand with regard to fear causes us to not want to know about what's going to happen to the earth. It causes us to not want to know about what's going to happen economically, what's going to happen environmentally, What's going to happen, you know, medically? What's going to happen to the earth itself? We don't want to know. It's far better to not know. That's what we feel and that's what we eventually project onto our environment. The reality, though, is without us releasing this childhood fear and terror that has been created inside of us, we will never enjoy a happy and desirous life. We can't. Because the fear will dictate everything we do. The fear will control us every single day. You'd be so amazed if once you become more aware. Remember we talked about stepping up the steps of awareness before? Well, see, most of us with regard to fear, if you like, most of us are here. We are here at the bottom because we're yet to deal with our first fears, right? But when you deal with your first fears and you have a different viewpoint of everything, you start seeing, wow, everybody's in fear. 
And you start seeing how every moment of your life was dictated by some fear that you had. Does that make sense? That's what you start seeing. Yeah. Well, you talked about God's vacuum cleaner trying to pulling us up. Yes. And I feel strongly what you're trying to explain is true. So how do we get support from this vacuum cleaner? Well, I've already given you the support mechanism. <laughs> right. If we look at, there's different scales inside of us. Right? And I've talked about this before in other uh, presentations that I know, you may not have seen. I know, I've seen, I've seen the scales. Sorry? I've seen the scales before. Can you remember them? Yeah, it's, it's about fear. And what was the opposite of fear? Love. Truth, okay. Truth. So if the, in the fear scale, remember fear is the false expectations appearing truth mm. as truth. Tr then there's actual truth. So the more fear I experience, it's because I'm not in a state of truth. So the more fear I have, I'm not in a state of truth yet. So the only thing that confronts fear is truth. Truth is the only thing that is going to confront fear. Now, that's not what's going to help release the emotion. Because there is emotion involved in this fear. And the thing that will help the emotion be released is, is love and desire. Whereas down on this side is numb. <laughs> right? So when you think about it, when you're in fear, you sort of go numb to everything, don't you? Have you noticed that? Like, it's just like, oh, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to feel, I don't know, you feel confusion and numbness even inside of yourself, yes? But, but if you have love and desire, then straight away that's going to motivate you to begin at least accepting these emotions. And if you have truth, then truth will confront the fear. Truth is the opposite to the fear. To the fear. So the more I'm willing to accept truth into my life... And the more I'm willing to act in a loving and desirous manner, the higher likelihood it is that my fear will no longer dominate my life. And we need to make this shift into truth. And, the way, so, and you can do this even though you're afraid, because if you have love and desire for yourself, you will realise one important truth, and that is fear is just another emotion. Now, this is a very important truth to understand. Fear is just another emotion. Fear is not real. It is just another emotion. All right? Now, I'm not saying that when the fear was created, the event wasn't real. What I'm saying is, now that the fear is inside of me, it is just another emotion that I can release. And if I choose to release it, it will no longer de dictate my life. It is just another emotion to release. The problem we have, though, is that we don't believe that. We don't believe fear is just another emotion to release. We believe, because, we're, because of this fear, we believe that if we feel it, we'll die. But that's just another emotion too. Because the reality is, the truth is, you can't die. Your physical body can go, but you still can't die. You, you can't not exist. Right? You'll just be in the spirit world, existing there, if your physical body dies. So even death is not true. It's not a truth. You see, the more we start to focus on the truth, the less our fear will dictate our life. It's our fear that dictates our life. Our, our desire to continue to feel that these false expectations we have are still real. They, we want to believe they're real. And while we want to believe they're real, we're not going to accept the truth. So, for example, if I said to you, I would like uh, one of you, uh, who's the most fearful about public speaking? No one wants to put up their hand. Yeah. <laughs> You're afraid of what I'm going to do with you next, aren't you? <laughs> Christina, 
Are you the most fearful about public speaking? I don't feel you are, actually. But uh, do you want to come up and do some speaking for five minutes? What's the feeling now? <laughs> Why do you feel afraid? These are just people. You know, when they're undressed, they still have the same bits and pieces. They're, they're just people like you and I. So why are we so afraid of them? Can you see what we're afraid of is what they will project at me? Can you see that's what we're afraid of? And we're, we're afraid of their anger, they're laughing at us. And that's one of the big things, isn't it, for yourself, like them laughing at us and being angry at us, being projected at me. And then how am I going to feel when they do that? I'm going to feel like terrible, sad, you know, like I just want to get out of here, I don't want to do this. I feel all these different emotions. I want to run, right, because I'm afraid. I want to run. So what am I really afraid of? I'm afraid, at the deepest level, what I'm really afraid of, I'm afraid of my own emotions. I'm really afraid that... I will feel a feeling that I won't be able to cope with by standing up here. Does that make sense? That's what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid of my own response to what might happen. So the reality is, and one of the basic truths that we need to understand about fear, is that we are actually never really afraid of anything external. We are really just afraid of what we might feel when that thing happens. So imagine you, you're on the, in a plane and you haven't got a parachute and you fall out of it. Now I'm sure quite a lot of fear will come up in that moment, right? There's no out here, you know. The law of gravity works pretty good. It seems pretty consistent with everyone else. <laughs> and, and you're there falling and you're falling. You know your life is about to end, yes? Most of us would feel terrified because we have a fear of death. And so we're terrified. It's not going to be a very painful death because it's going to be pretty fast, isn't it, once we hit that ground. But the issue is the period in between, you see. We're feeling all this terror, aren't we? As we're falling, we're just feeling all this terror. And, and we're terrified of what? We're terrified of our life ending. We're terrified of our relationships ending. And in that moment, we're not coping with it because we're afraid of even our own feelings about all those things. That's really what we're afraid of. If you weren't afraid of your own feelings about anything, you would be able to do anything you desire, wouldn't you? So imagine you had a passion. So imagine one of your passions was playing the guitar. You would not be afraid of playing the guitar in front of one person or in front of 100,000 persons if you really had a passion with no fear, would you? You would do it either way, wouldn't you? Because you just had the passion. But now you throw in your feelings about being in front of 100,000 people. What does that feel like? There's all their expectations, all their demands upon you. How does that now feel? Now, you might be a good guitarist, but now, because of all those projections, you might just freeze completely because of fear, because of not wanting to feel how you may feel. You see, in the end, really most of our fears are all about ourselves. That's the thing we need to come to appreciate. So when we're afraid of discussing earth changes, really what are we afraid of? We're afraid of how we will feel discussing the subject. That's what we're afraid of. Does that make sense? That's all we're afraid of. We're just afraid of what might come up for us that we might not be able to cope with, is the feeling we have. God designed you to cope with all of your feelings. So a basic truth that I need to accept is God designed me to feel all of my feelings. And fear is just 
a feeling. So therefore, God designed me to feel fear. Because fear is just a feeling. And if I understand that that is a basic truth, and I feel that truth, you see, it's, you can't tell yourself the truth. You've got to eventually feel it for it to be true, right? So at the moment, what happens for most of us is we're yet to even feel the truth of that one statement. That God designed us to feel all of our feelings and that fear is just a feeling. Most of us are yet to feel that as a truth. We think that's true and when AJ says it, we go, yep, yeah, no, that makes logical sense to me. I think I can agree with that statement, right? But when it actually comes to feeling that as a truth in your own life day to day, most of us do not feel that yet. And we need to get to the point where we do feel that if we really want to progress with holding on to our passions and desires. If we really want to follow our passions and desires, we need to get to the point where we understand here that basic truth. That basic truth that God designed me to feel everything and fear is just a feeling, an emotion. That's all it is. All right. Marina, down the front there. And then I cross the anti. Um, at the moment, I don't know whether or not, I don't feel if it's true or not that all of this is happening, but I can connect to feelings I have of codependency and losing people and being alone. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask, is, is this a good route to take at the moment? Like, would that help me get into the fear of being able to feel the truth? Definitely. But uh, again, remember you need to tell yourself the truth even with those in order to feel them. So, for example, with codependency. That means that you feel you are dependent on another person for your life in some way, like to feel happy or secure or whatever way. What is the truth? There is only one being in the universe that you're dependent upon for your life, and that is God. That's the only person who you need in your life. You don't need any single friend. You don't need any friends. You don't need any acquaintances. You don't need parents. You don't need anybody. You only need God to survive. What about your soulmate? <laughs> you don't even need your soulmate to survive when you're at one with God, do you? You'd love to have them yeah. and they would enhance your life because they're the other half of yourself. But at the end of the day, you don't need them. You're not needy for them. Does that make sense? So, so the truth is that we do not need a relationship with anyone else. Therefore, every relationship we have is a gift. And then we will treat every relationship we have as a gift and not something that we need. Right? Can you see? So, but it's got to be, again, a feeling in me. So, so yes, dealing with any of the codependent addictions and the fears associated with codependency are very important in part, a part of it. But you need to tell yourself the truth. See, what we often do is we tell ourselves the lie. What we do is we tell ourselves, I do need my mother. I do need my friends. <laughs> To live. If I didn't have my friends, I wouldn't want to live. And I put to you that if you didn't have your friends and then felt that you didn't want to live, then that's an emotional error and it's untruth. Therefore, it needs to be corrected. When you're in a state of love and you're in a state of connectedness with God, you won't feel that way. That's what I put to you. Right? So this is where we've got to be very careful. You see, we can, we can say, all right, I want to deal with my addictions with my friends, for example. But underneath, we're still telling ourselves the lie. The lie being, I need friends. Yeah. Right? So we might say, I want to deal with my codependent addictions with my mum and dad. But underneath, I'm telling myself, I need my mum and dad's approval to survive. But that's not a truth. But we're telling ourselves it's still the truth, you see. And this is why the truth is so important. If we keep telling ourselves lies, we'll never be able to feel the fear that's associated with those lies. Yeah. Yeah? So, so before this discussion, how many of you would have felt that you need your friends? Everyone needs friends. Would you would have felt that? Everyone needs friends? That's what I felt. Like I felt everyone needs friends. Right? The reality is we don't need any friends and we can still have happy life. Now that sounds really strange, doesn't it, to say? That is so opposite of what the world would tell you. It's also opposite to what most psychologists would tell you, isn't it? 
But the reality is if you've got God as your friend, you will not need all these other friends. And therefore, any friend you do have, you'll appreciate fully. You'll actually love them and you'll be able to give to them without expecting anything in return. So you'll actually be able to be a good friend yourself where you don't have expectations and demands and other things going on with them. You see, when we tell ourselves the truth, that helps us identify the fear. If we tell ourselves the fear, we have no hope of ever seeing the truth. So if I tell myself, I need my friends to survive, I need my friends to survive, that is just the expression of a fear, and while I tell myself that fear, I am never going to emotionally feel that I don't need my friends to survive. Because I'm already telling myself and feeling the complete opposite. Do you see? And this is where confronting the truth is so important. And this is why I began the conversation this afternoon at the break with the statement that, that actually most of us don't want to know the truth. Because can you see the power of the truth when we know it? It changes everything. If you really fully accept the truth inside of your heart, it changes every way you act, it changes what you do, it changes how you, what you decide to do in the future, it changes your friendships, your relationships and everything else, always for the better. It, it cannot do anything else. That's the power of the truth. That's why I said to you, the truth will set you free. Because it results in complete freedom. That's what the truth does. And if we have love uh, and desire as well as the truth, now we have a motivation for truth. We have, we, because we become more loving in the process. That's the motivation for understanding and feeling the truth. And in the process of being more loving and more desirous, we're definitely going to experience more joy. So what we we'll find is a lot of people on the path at the moment are not experiencing very much joy. And it doesn't mean you're experiencing joy, the person. <laughs> it means you're not experiencing very much joy, the emotion, right? So, and the reason why we're uh, not experiencing very much joy is because we are not realising that there is a wonderful power in the truth and there is a wonderful joy in following your desires and passions that are harmonious with love. We are so frightened to follow our desires and passions harmonious with love, we are so frightened by the prospect of dealing with our fears because we have a deep belief, many of us and most of us most on the planet have a deep belief that we cannot feel fear as a choice. We believe that fear has to be felt when it's only forced upon us. <laughs> right? And I put to you that we can feel fear as a choice because fear is just an Emotion. That's all it is. Nothing else. And God created you to feel all of your emotions. So therefore, God created you to feel your fear. So can I make a suggestion to you over this week? Have a, have a, if you haven't already done so in your progression, and sometimes even if you have, it's wise to do this again, Write down a list of what, you, what fears come up for you when you think about the future. And in particular, if you think about the future regarding what might happen to the earth. What fears come up for you? Let yourself be really honest about it. And you'll find, you'll find that many of the fears won't be, oh, I'm afraid of dying a painful death. They'll be, I'm afraid of losing all my friends. I'm afraid of making changes in my life and then more my friends laughing at me. Uh, those kind of fears are often far more powerful in our lives. I'm afraid of losing my children. I'm afraid of my children passing. If my children pass, I want to pass. I've had so many mothers say that to me. And my answer to them is, you are far too heavily invested in your children's life. In other words, you are afraid of living your own if you feel that way. So, so what we need to do is allow ourselves to feel the, emo the real emotions that are behind our fears. And if you do that, you'll find that most of your real emotions have nothing much to do with you know, being afraid of being tortured to death or anything like that, but rather they have a lot more to do 
with what happens after these events and what happens with your interpersonal relationships. A lot of our fears are along those lines. So for that reason, there's not much more I can say about this until you want to know the truth. You see? See, if I love you, I will respond to the desire of your soul as far as I am able. And if the desire of your soul is to not know the truth, then it is not the right thing for me to do to tell you a truth you do not want to know. Can you see that? Because, that's, because then I'd be breaking your, your free will, what's coming out of you as a collective desire. When we all have a desire to know the truth, that's, I feel, when our spirit friends and many others will be able to give us the truth very openly, succinctly and directly, and we will have very, very clear options as to what we should do if we want to act upon that truth. That's what will happen. But until that point in time, if we're blocked, closed down, pushing away the truth... The wise thing for any person who loves you to do is to say, okay, that person doesn't want to know the truth, so I'm not going to tell them the truth they don't want to know. I can't until they have a desire. If you go, Nicole, and then over here. And over there too, Mike. And over there too, Mike, if you can. Yeah. So let's say um, I, go to fam do I go to my family and start telling them, okay, guys, I'm going to pack my stuff, I'm going to move to somewhere else facing my own fear, telling them about what I've learned about earth changes. Would that mean now that their soul had a desire to listen, th to hear this? Well, I, mean, I, like I would firstly put to you, never make a, a decision to move based on what you hear about earth changes. Yeah, right. Make a decision based on what you feel to be true yes. yourself about yeah. earth changes. Do you understand yes, the difference? Yes, yeah, I do. You see, you see, when we base our choices and decisions on what we hear, mm -hmm. rather than on what we feel to be true, we're actually acting out of fear. Mm -hmm. Can you see why? Well, I can see that um, hmm. as long as I have not understood yet myself what is true, can you see that then I'm I trusting would, somebody would, else yeah. to tell me the truth and then I'm believing them without yeah. feeling about yeah. it? Why would I act upon such a thing? I could only act because I'm afraid. Yes. And to me there is no point in acting upon something that you do not agree with or that you do not personally know. Right. Do, do, does that make sense to everyone? So, so don't do something just because somebody tells you to do it. Mm. Do it because you feel to do it in your own soul. You feel, I will have a desire to do this. I have a desire to go there. I have a desire to do this. Go and do it because of that reason. Don't do it for mm. anything that anybody tells you, mm. whether that person is Jesus or anybody mm. else. Don't do it. Mm. Do it because you feel it. Yes. Right? So don't, don't get into this trap of doing things just because somebody tells you, this is what they believe is true. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So that's the first thing. Yeah. The second thing is, why do we have such a desire to tell our parents or our family and not everybody? Can you see there is also an emotional injury. We are viewing our family as more important than the rest of the world. Mm. What does, how does God view everybody? Equally. <laughs> Equally. <laughs> so God, so God yeah. treats your dad the same way as he treats Peter over there and the same way he treats me, yeah. right? Yeah. God views us all as equal. So why would you tell your dad something and not tell me it mm -hmm. if you had the opportunity? Can you see already mm -hmm. there's a feeling of non-equality mm -hmm. inside of ourselves that we would have to address? Yeah. That's unloving. Because when, when I'm loving, I will want to love you and it doesn't matter to me whether you're my family. It doesn't matter to me whether you're my partner. I will still want to love you mm. in the sense that I want to tell you the truth and I want to hear the truth from you. Yeah. And I don't want to judge you. I don't want to accuse you. I would want to do all of that. And if I had the truth available to me, 
I would want to tell it with you, even, even though you're not my family. Yeah. So, so why would I focus on my family? Well, <laughs> probably because of the emotional investments that I have with my family. or the Because I'm afraid injuries. of what they'll think of me. Yeah. I'm afraid of losing them. Mm. I'm afraid of all sorts of mm. things, right? And I don't want to feel those mm -hmm. fears. So I tell my family first. Right? Right. That's why I generally tell them. Can you see how even most of these decisions are caused by fear? Yeah. In the end, right? They cause uh, our, dec our decision to tell our family rather than, or to tell certain friends but not other friends, or to tell only our friends and our family but not tell everybody we meet. Like they're all driven by fears that we have. Yeah. Now, it's one thing to feel the emotion coming from you. Does your family want to know? You're asking me. Well, have I'm they not so sure about that. <laughs> have they demonstrated to you in the past that mm. they want to know? They have demonstrated that they would not want to know. They don't want to know. Yeah. So, so can you see me then telling them would be, I'd be trying to impose yeah. upon their free will. They've already shown me they don't want to know. Yes. And I would just say, oh, okay, oh, look. So uh, what I'd say to my family is, look, I, I want to talk about a lot of things about earth changes and stuff, but last time we chat, you didn't want to know. Mm. So, so I can't tell you. And we can talk about it when you want to know. Yeah. And they'll go, what do you mean we don't want to know? Of course we want to know. <laughs> well, no, Mum, every time you get angry, you prove to me you don't want to know. Yeah. Like, a person who wants to know doesn't get angry, do they? Yeah. Like, if you're there soaking up truth, soaking up truth, and you really want the truth in your heart, do you get angry with the person who's giving you it? Mm. Don't you go, oh, this is great, this is great, <laughs> oh, this is great, give me more. Isn't that the way you are instead? Right? So, so a person who's getting angry with you and saying, I don't, you know, getting angry with you, what you believe, are they wanting to know the truth? Nope. No, they don't want to know the truth. So, okay, you don't want to know the truth, that's fine. Mm. Well, the Greek, what's the Greek way of doing that? Okay. <laughs> 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 I don't know. So, you know, the key, the key is just to let ourselves, to let ourselves feel like they don't want to know, so that's okay not to tell them. Okay. What is my strong desire to tell my family, but not a strong desire to tell everyone else? Mm then that, that is obviously an emotion. Yeah. I want my family to be saved along with me. I want, you know, not bad things mm. to happen to my family. I want them to be safe. I want to feel them to be... I want, I want to feel that they're secure. Mm. And, and all of that is just emotional projection, which is actually based upon fear. The truth is they can't die. Even if their yep. physical body perishes, they haven't died. Mm. They're still going to be alive. They're probably going to mm. be in al almost identical condition than they are right now. They're going to be almost the same person. I haven't lost anything. I can connect to them still if I wish to. Mm. So I haven't lost anything. And if they want to know, then I'll tell them. Yeah. If they don't want to know, then yeah. don't tell them. Okay. Yeah. Does that you. make sense? Yeah. And what I'm illustrating in that discussion with you is that, is that so many of our choices, even with our family and our friends, are motivated by fear. They're not motivated yeah. by love. They're motivated by fear. They're not motivated by the fact that we feel everyone is equal. They're motivated by the fact we feel our family has this importance in our life, our friends have that importance in our life, and other people who I meet on the street have that importance mm -hmm. in our life. People in Greece have that importance <coughs> in my life. People in, you know, in Latvia, there's one of them here, have this importance in my <laughs> life. Right? And then people down in Australia, they have that importance <laughs> in my life because they're at the bottom of the world. And we have... We have no conception inside of us of equality. Yep. The key is to deal with that emotionally. Mm. We want to gain a conception of equality if we wish to love like God loves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, over here, thank you. Do you remember your question? Yeah, but I remember. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> but I, I, want, I will ask it, but I wanted to add to what you're saying now, that how do you judge a mother's fear for her child? It's based on love, though, isn't it? No. That, doesn't fair end in love even no. so? No. Um, one of the things I wanted, wanted to present today, and we will in another day, is a basic thing that the world views as love, but it is nothing to do with the God's view of love, mm -hmm. is this concept that, f that fear, that love is fearful. Mm -hmm. And many people justify it with their relationship between their par parents and children. In <laughs> other words, I'm afraid for my child's welfare, that's because I love them. And I put to you that God 
is not afraid of your welfare. Mm. God has created everything in such a way that he, he has created a perfect system and he's not afraid of what you'll do with that system. And I put to you that if, whenever we are afraid of our child's welfare, we are no longer loving them and now we are controlling them. Mm. And, and this is a very important thing to understand as a parent. There is no love in fear at all. No love in fear at all. We must understand this is a basic truth if we are ever going to understand God's love for us. God is not afraid of, for you. God is not afraid for, of your decisions and choices. And God is not afraid of what happens to you. And if I am afraid of what happens to you, then I don't love you anymore. I'm afraid for you. And in my fear, it's amazing what I can actually force you or manipulate you into doing mm. so you see many mothers in particular doing this with their children you know they they will nag them and nag them and nag them about not going out and riding the motorbike you know and they'll be angry and upset with them about them having bought a motorbike and they'll be you know i'm talking about a male who buys a motorbike and he's tearing around the place on his motorbike and they are so afraid that they impose this fear daily on the child and the child doesn't grow up feeling free. And he manifests an accident. And he manifests an accident. Often does, yes, for the sake of the mother's fear. Yes, I agree. But, but he doesn't grow up feeling free. And love always creates freedom, you see. So he doesn't grow up feeling free. He grows up feeling controlled by his mother. That's what he grows up feeling. And mum says, I do this because I love you. No, she does this because she's afraid. And she's afraid of her feelings of what will happen when, she, when he dies, as if there's any such thing as death. He, she's afraid that when he dies, she's going to have all this grief. And she doesn't know what she's going to do with all that grief. And so what does she do? She imposes her fear of her grief upon him and causes him to change his behaviour. And that is not love. Love never does that. We want to, myself and Mary want to talk a lot more about the comparison between the world's view of love and our view of love, uh, and God's view of love, sorry. And the world's view of love is very, very different to God's view of love. And this, as, this idea of the justification of fear it, as a loving thing is a, is a terrible thing that we put upon each generation. We need to come to understand emotionally that fear is never loving, ever. It's never loving. The results of fear are always unloving. They're never loving. And, uh, and there is daily, if you think about it, in your own lives, there's daily proof of that. Yeah. How many of you now, as adults, are afraid to act for no other reason that your mother was afraid of that same thing? Yeah. Like... I, I, remember, I remember my first experience with spiders in, the South, in Australia. In South Australia, where I grew up, we have quite a number of poisonous spiders. In Australia, I think we have the most poisonous spiders in the world, actually, and the most poisonous snakes, too. Anyway, um, one of the poisonous spiders in, Aust in Australia is like a black widow, but it's got a red back, and it's called a red-backed spider. And it looks like a black widow with a big red stripe down the back of it. And it's only a little spider, like when I say a little spider, about that big. Right? In Australia, there's spiders that big. So that big is quite small. Anyway, I would have the little spider, the red bait spider, on my hand. Right? And I, this was when I was only two years of age. And I had a little red spider out the backyard. You get them all over Australia, so you can get them anywhere there, right? And you pick it up and it's just crawling over your hand and I'm watching its red back, watching what it's doing and so forth. My mum comes along and screams and yells at me. Why? Because she's afraid. Right? I wasn't afraid before then. But do you reckon I was after then? <laughs> I sure was. I sure was afraid and after then. And the spider then. was afraid too. And Exactly. And the likelihood of it now biting me is much greater, of course, right? Because, uh, because of the response to my fear. So, so in Australia, we have a lot of snakes as well. We have uh, the deadliest snake in the world, which is called a taipan snake. A bite, two minutes, and you can die from a bite from a taipan. And, uh, and there are quite a number of them. They're very, very shy, though. But it's amazing how many mothers in Australia are very afraid of their children ever seeing a snake. 
Now we have uh, brown snakes and black snakes and red belly black snakes and all these other snakes. We have, uh, I think it's the 10 most poisonous snakes in the world actually in Australia. So you imagine this is a, a fear mother's nightmare, <laughs> isn't it? Like, because she's just afraid. And they're so prevalent that you see them very regularly, especially during summer because it's very hot and they're all outside sunning themselves, usually in the grass or whatever else. And so quite often you would actually walk up and tread on the snake like because the snake's just curled around just sunning itself out on the on the ground and uh, and you don't need to be very afraid of them really but most people are terrified of them Uh, mary at the moment is still terrified of snakes so so we have this snake at our house and he's a green tree snake he's not poisonous at all and he tried to get into our tent. We, we sleep in a tent for about nine or ten months of the year. And we have a tent there. And, our, and Mary opens the, the uh, door of the tent. And there laying across the doorway, <laughs> right over where she... And she steps over it without really realising it. And then the snake moves, right? And, he's, and he moves and he goes in the tent. And uh, so we have to shoo him out of the tent. And then he goes up inside of the tent. So I had to pull him out of the tent and take him somewhere. But... But she's so afraid that I'm just going into a panic feeling her fear. <laughs> so I feel terrible feeling her fear. I'm going, just go away, relax. I'm okay with this, you know. The poor thing, the poor snake, he's getting very distressed. And because of the fear, there is obviously going to now be a response on the part of the animal generally. And you see, this is the problem is that we don't realise that a lot of these fears that we have only create the reality because the fear is present. That's the only reason why they create the reality. If the fear wasn't present, there would be nothing to create to trigger the fear that's within us. So, so my suggestion is to never, when it comes to this viewpoint that you know, when we're afraid for our children, that we have just reason or just cause to be afraid of our chil- for our children, understand that it's not coming from a position of love. It's coming from a position of our own fear and what our own fear feels will happen if something happens to our child, what we will feel and what we feel like we can't feel. So you imagine for most parents, if their child passes away, there's huge amounts of grief, yes? And most parents do not want to ever experience that grief. right? And so they avoid that grief by projecting on the child, don't you do anything dangerous, don't you do this, don't you do that. And in fact, the child grows up feeling hemmed in by all of the rules that the parent now has created because of the parent's fear. And this is, this is a damaging effect on fear on our children. So my feelings are never, ever view fear as a justified excuse for doing something. Almost forgetting my question. But what, is, uh, what are your thoughts about information and ignorance? Uh, ignorance as the enemy of uh, not being afraid and, and uh, information as a way of feeling safe instead of having fear. And I have an example for that. I have three children. Yep. I'm obviously not Greek. I'm from Norway. Yep. And I have three children. I would bring them to... The whatever health station it was, for, for vaccines and things. Mm-hmm. And the nurses would always say, what is it with you foreigners? Your children never cry when we put a needle in their hand. Mm-hmm. And I would tell them it's because I tell them it's going to hurt on its way to doing you some good. So what are your thoughts around information? Um, can I contrast information with truthful information for a start? To me... There is information and then there is truthful information. Truthful information will always have a beneficial effect on fear. In other words, it will always lower the amount of fear a person feels. Information by itself does not lower fear. In fact, if you look at the environment in which we live, we're bombarded with information, most of which is fear generating. Right? So in other words... We, we get bombarded with information of all the things that are happening around the world and instead of feeling more safe, we feel less safe. So, and, and oftentimes the information is not truthful, but rather it's misinformation. It's, it's not information that is true, 
but rather information given by what I would call spin doctors, you know, using words in order to make people feel a certain thing. I don't believe information on itself is any good for mankind. I always feel truthful information is beneficial in every single case. Does that make sense? Yes. So, so just because you receive information, it doesn't mean that that information is beneficial. Now, if I give you an example, you took your children to get vaccined. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Now, that was a fear-based decision. Because you do not trust that if the person was completely clear of all their fear, that no matter what would happen to them, they could never catch an illness. Right? I would not have done it today. <laughs> I, I realise that. I'm just talking about the experience at the time, right? So what I'm saying is, at that moment in time, you, did not, you had a fear for their life, a fear of them catching a disease, and so you got them vaccined because of that fear. The fear drove the action. Then you told them a truth, which is great. It's going to hurt. What do most mothers tell them? It's not going to hurt. It's not going to hurt. <laughs> so, so you told them the truth. It's going to hurt. And you felt that it was beneficial to take them out of some fear. But you at least didn't add to the fear with error. Do, do you see? Mm -hmm. And so that is naturally going to make things better on the child than if you added to the fear with error by saying to the child... It's not going to hurt. And so then when they get the injection and it does hurt, what would the child then feel? They'd feel not only the pain of the hurt. Let down. They'd feel betrayed by their own mother, which is a much greater hurt than being told the truth. Mm. Does that make sense? Mm. And this is the reason why your children had less response to the vaccine than a person who would have been told the error. Mm. Do you follow me? Mm -hmm. And this is where it is very important, I feel, to tell children the truth all the time, all the time. So if something is hurting, it hurts. Not, oh, it doesn't hurt, it doesn't hurt. Always tell the truth. The truth is always the doorway to the emotion and the truth is always the doorway to releasing fear. And that's the reason why your children had less fear about having a vaccine than the average child would have had. Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. What's the time? 6.10. 6.10, Okay. Should we keep going? Sure. How long for? 15 minutes. <laughs> 15 minutes. Marina, you were hot on the time there, girl. Last night you were too. <laughs> That's no worries. <laughs> Can we have a mic over this way? Yeah, well, a um, little more about this... Uh, Earth changes and fear and all this part. I've been uh, studying or um, making making investigations with the Mayan calendar and people and uh, even uh, people that uh, explains how the acceleration of the time and an acceleration of the things happening. Yep. And in the last uh, time, when you start talking about Earth changes, becomes a wave of of people spreading that in Sweden and talking about what's the best, safest places to live. And, and I feel that for me it was like, okay, wait a minute. My business is to make my relation with God to open to love, yep. <coughs> love to myself. Yep. And then when the earth change happened, I just trust that I'm not going to be there. And I don't know if that's a denial. Yeah. It's a no. Or it's where, where, where I am because I'm, 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 you know, when you talk about the change, I'm very, I feel very, very, like, not connected to. Okay. To yes. Many people do this. Many people feel not connected to the discussion, right? And so they go. And in fact, uh, Mary, Mary was one of those persons, weren't you, darling? Wherever she is. Yep. You were one of those persons, weren't you? Like, didn't feel any, like, just no feelings, no feelings, no feelings about it. So. When the reality is that, that Mary has quite a number of large feelings about earth changes, not related to the changes themselves, but more related to how her father feels about them. So, you see, a lot of times we detune from emotions quite cleverly. We use our mind, our intellect, in quite a clever way to detune. My suggestion is you will have a feeling about everything once you're one with God. You'll have a feeling about everything. They won't be negative feelings, but you will have feelings. 
You'll have feelings of certainty or certainty that something is not going to happen. You'll have feelings. They will be present all the time. And you won't have any avoidance of discussing a certain issue. Right? Any avoidance at all. You'll, you'll be totally okay with fully embracing a discussion of an issue. With regard to this earth change issue for yourself, um, what you say is true. Our relationship with God is the primary thing and then our relationship with developing our relationship with ourselves is the next primary thing. Mm -hmm. And our relationship then, well, of course, with our soulmate, which is the other half of ourselves. But then comes the feeling of desire. You see, one thing that's happening for a lot of people is they're not tuning into their desires with this earth change topic. They're not saying to themselves, do I want to live? Do I want to pass? Do I want, what do I want to do after I live? Where do I want to live? What kind of life do I want to have? And they almost rely on somebody else creating all of that for them. Now I put to you that if you know about earth changes and you personally believe they're going to occur, assuming that's to be true, and many don't, so that's okay, but let's assume that you do believe they're going to occur, then I put to you that not taking action is a denial of your own self-responsibility. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. In other words, what you're trying to do is you're trying to place in the hands of somebody else the responsibility for your life after the changes occur. And that wouldn't be a loving act towards them to do. Can you see that? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So... So usually when a person detunes from the subject after that, it's because they don't want to make some choices and decisions about what they're going to do with their life after earth changes and they're just hopeful that something will come along and sort it out for them. Now that is not acting in the desire. That is putting responsibility for your life into somebody else's hands. But somehow I feel that this is going to be okay. Ah, yes, Mary told me this many times, didn't you, darling? <laughs> I'm going to be okay. I'll be okay. Don't you worry. I'll be okay. No matter where I am, I'll be okay. okay. And I cannot see how that can be a truth unless you make some decisions and choices. You see? It's a bit like um, if I know something is going to happen and I believe it in my heart that it's going to happen, then why would I not then take some decisions to, to prepare my life for it occurring? Can you see that if I don't take decisions for preparing for its occurrence, then I am going to be asking somebody else to after it's happened. You see, there are many people who believe, oh, I'll be able to just go to the place that, you know, at the last minute, I'll go to the right location. Right? Or I'll be inspired to go to the right location at the last minute. Now, I put to you, if it's at the last minute, that's not showing very much love to the other people in that location. Because many of them might have prepared for the changes and you're now imposing yourself on their life and expecting them to look after you. You're expecting them to have water for you. You're expecting them to have food for you. You're expecting them to have shelter for you and clothing for you and all these things. And you didn't want to make any of those decisions before you kn when you knew that the changes were occurring. This is assuming you know. Does that make sense? Now, many of us don't want to know. I put to you, many of us still don't want to know. And so we have this viewpoint, oh, if they occur, then I'll do this. If I'll be in the right place if they occur, and so forth. And that's because we're avoiding the choice. When we do these things, we are actually avoiding taking personal responsibility for our own choices. That's what we're doing. And my suggestion is the emotion isn't fear of earth changes. The emotion is fear of making your own choices about what you're going to do in your life from in regards to your desires. That's the emotion that drives that feeling. And myself and Mary have discussed this a lot together, haven't we, darling, about how much Mary didn't want to detune from her own desires and passions. She wanted to detune from taking personal responsibility for her life. She wanted, to detune, she wanted other people to be responsible for her life rather than she make choices and decisions that would help her life in the future. And is there other motions, Nala, you would like to mention? Uh, microphone. Sorry. I actually didn't really care if I died. 
Exactly. That's that, what it got that's down That's my to. main emotion. I'm yeah. happy to dig a trench or grow some veggies, but I actually didn't mind if I passed. Yeah. So what was driving her decision that uh, it doesn't matter what happens was this feeling that she had that she didn't really care if she died or lived. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, I put to you that a person who is living in their passion does care. Not they're afraid. They're not afraid. They care. Because if I'm living in my passion, I can decide, all right, okay, if I was in the spirit world, what would I like to be doing if I was there? And if I was on earth, what would I like to be doing? Mm. Now, I know for certain for myself, I want to be on earth after these earth changes. That's the way I feel. I'm mm. very passionate about that. I want to be on earth after these earth changes because I, want, I know that I can affect change on earth by being on earth far better than I can if I'm in the spirit world. Yeah. Does that make sense? Because I'm on earth and if I'm in a positive place and if I get into a better place of love and a better place of love, eventually if I get in for one moment with God on earth, I can affect many positive changes on earth in that state. That's what I want. Now, my desire is the redemption of the human race. That's my desire. When I say redemption, what I mean, my passionate desire, which has been my passionate desire since the first <laughs> century, is this desire that I would love to have to see everybody at least know that they can connect to God on a personal basis and enjoy this passionate connection with God that, that causes them to live in perfect happiness for the rest of their existence in an everlasting sense. That's my passion. And I spent 2,000 years in the spirit world trying to help the earth realise the things that I taught in the first century. And, you know, I found it really hard. I've, I con I've connected to more people since I've been talking about it in the last three years than I have all that previous time, really, on earth, in terms of the effect that I had on them, right? Just by being on earth. So I know where I want to be because I have a passionate desire and a very strong direction of where I'd like to be, I know what decisions I want to make. And I put to you that when you have a passionate desire and a strong feeling of what you want to do, you will know where you want to be and you won't have an attitude, oh, it doesn't matter if I die or, or live. You won't have that attitude at all. You'll have a very strong desire to live either here on earth or in the spirit world, one or the other. But you, and it won't be mixed. It won't be, oh, if it, if it happens that way, then so be it. It won't be like that. It won't be que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be, you know. <laughs> it will be, I know what I want and I'm going to seek that as a desire. That's what it will be. So just be very careful about um, a feeling of um, a laissez-faire feeling, you know, like a feeling of oh, I'm not, I don't really care either way. Be very careful of those feelings because they cover over a lot of very deep emotional scars and if we can if we can notice when we don't care usually we care very deeply but we tell ourselves we don't care to avoid a whole group of emotions or a whole group of responsibilities personal responsibilities of love towards yourself and people around you so i put to you that a person who decides all right i realize that uh, uh, if earth changes happen then it will turn out that AJ was right. And if AJ is right, then it would make sense to me that the safest place to be is somewhere near his house. <laughs> right? And so what I'm going to do is when I notice the first earth changes happen, I'm just going to get a flight and fly to his house. And I'll be right. And you know when you rock up at my door what I would say? I told you about earth changes two, three, four years ago. You've had three or four years to prepare for them. I am not going to provide you with your life now that you're rocking up at my doorstep because you're being unloving to me. Go somewhere else <laughs> and work out your life there. That's what I'll say to you because that will be the loving thing for me to say. Right? You see, there is a responsibility with knowledge. We need to come to some conclusion on this matter just like we need to come to some conclusion on all matters. And, and we need to come to the conclusion that I want to be as loving as possible, not only to myself, but also to every person around me, every person on the planet. 
I will not expect you to create my life for me in the future. If I have a positive desire to live on the earth, I will decide to create something that will cause me to live on the earth as far as the best of my knowledge and ability affords me. I, I will not rely on you to create that for me and expect to rock up at your doorstep at the last minute. Yeah. I will, because I love you, I would not foist myself upon you in such a time of stress. Because I love you, I would actually say to myself, okay, I want to live, I do want to live, and I do care about what happens to me because I want to be a part of these earth changes and I want to be a part of what will happen after them and on the earth. I want to do that. Many of us don't want to do that yet, and that's fine. Say to yourself, I don't want to do that yet. Tell yourself the truth. So I want to do that, so I go, I want to do that, but I do not want to make somebody else responsible for my life in that place. I want to create as much as possible of my life for myself, given my different um, resources available to me. I want to create as much as possible of my life now while I have that opportunity. If I love you, that's what I will do. If I don't love you that much but I love me, then I might do the other. I might you know, wait till the last minute, fly to your doorstep and hope everything's fine. And so we've got to be very careful of our un unloving decisions. You see, what a lot of us do is we go, I am uncertain about this matter. Right? Frankly, many of us are uncertain about the matter of earth changes. You've not come to a decision either way. My suggestion is you still need to learn to follow your desires and passions, whether you're uncertain about this issue or not. So what are your desires and passions? Focus on them, even if you're uncertain about this issue. It doesn't matter if you follow your desires and passions in England and it happens to be washed by a great big wave and eventually you're in the spirit world still following your desires and passions. That's fine, isn't it? There's nothing wrong with that if that's what happens. Isn't there anything wrong with that? No, of course there's nothing wrong with that. You're allowed to make those decisions and choices. And, and my suggestion is if you've learnt to follow your passions and desires on earth, then there's a pretty good chance you're going to do the same thing in the spirit world. Right? But if you haven't learnt to follow your passions and desires on earth, and if you haven't learnt to take responsibility for your life while you're on earth, then there's a much higher likelihood that you arrive in the spirit world still passionless, still desireless, and still not knowing what to do. Now that would be a lot more dangerous for you and a lot more unhappy for you than if you had the opposite. Right? So you don't have to make a choice about earth change stuff. You don't. You don't have to do anything about it if you don't want to. Only do it because you, inside of you, are convinced. But then, even then, don't make choices out of fear. Make choices about what decisions you want to take because you want to go a certain direction in your life. Don't do it because you're afraid. Don't do it because somebody else tells you to do it. Feel your desires and passions. Feel them inside of yourself and then embrace them in your life. And, I, and if you do that, you will often end up being in the right place at the right time, as the saying goes. But not only that, you'll end up in the right place at the right time, prepared. Right? Not in the right place at the right time by accident, <laughs> but rather in the right place at the right time because you're prepared. And the more prepared you are, the easier your life is going to be. Information, yeah, information, truthful information will allow you to have that preparedness. Yeah, Christina? It's, coming. It, it's okay. Um, I'm more on the numb and fear side, and I yep. struggle a bit with what are my desires. Yep. Like when I was like a teenager and in the 20s, they were much stronger, but several years now their life decreased yeah. a lot that's because as we get older our fears kick in and so we feel less yeah yeah we feel more numb more fearful less desirous yep. yes but still long before I, I met you three years ago 
I had dreams about earth changes and things that I didn't know, like in my awake state. And I went to the internet and checked and I realized the dreams were like accurate about what's going to happen. Um, and I have this desire and I, it feels almost certain that I will survive. And this desire, I don't, there's still emotions, but I feel it's possible that I can manage to process them till then. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, yeah, my question now. Uh, so I'm confused about is that a real desire or just based on some injury? Or yeah, I feel what's happening for many of you is this. You, your fear is kicking in and the problem with fear kicking in without you fully feeling it and working your way through it, in other words, the problem with living in fear is that the spirits who want you to remain afraid just surround you constantly. So, so they are... Spirits who, who are in a place of anger um, are, and also in a place of control and manipulation where they want to control and manipulate others, they just surround and oppress a person in fear. And this is what's happening for many people. Many people, the more they go along the divine love path, they become more and more afraid and more suppressed and more suppressed and they feel less joy, less joy, less joy and there's no desire now present. And, and the reason is they're under so much spirit oppression through their fear. See, when you're willing to feel the fear and work your way through it emotionally rather than living in it, what will happen is that you will no longer attract those spirits who oppress you even further and you will be able to again feel your desires passionately. So whenever you don't feel desire passionately, focus on the fact that you must be afraid and what are you afraid of and start feeling those fears by feeling them in your body. You know, and things like massage and other things like that can help you greatly in experiencing these fears and releasing them from you. Because the fear is always going to affect desire. Fear and desire, remember I said this over the weekend, Mary said it too and I've said it, fear and desire totally incompatible with each other. While you're afraid, you will not desire anything. As soon as you release your fear, then you will desire things until such a point as another fear comes along, then you won't desire it again. That's how it goes. And we need to deal with these fears. Notice when you're numb, when you're numb, not feeling anything, that's because you're feeling really oppressed and you don't want to feel what you're afraid of, right, at all. So let yourself start addressing. Pray about feeling the fears. The fear is the secret to unlocking the rest of your emotions. The emotional processing basically goes like this. You start with your addiction. Um, sorry, we don't start with our addictions. We just let's start at the bottom. Down at the bottom, there is really deep grief and shame, right? On top of that is a series of beliefs about grief and shame. Those belief systems create your fears. On top of your fears is a series of beliefs about fears. Right? That's why we feel afraid of our own fear, because we have a whole set of beliefs about them that are false. These are all false beliefs, locking them down. Right? And then on top of the, the beliefs about our fear is... What do you reckon it is? Uh, it's, it's really our expectations, isn't it? And demands. Right? They're our expectations. On top of our expectations is a series of beliefs about the expectations. And they create our anger. On top of our anger, if I can continue is our beliefs about anger. Uh, anger is bad, it's not spiritual, it's, not, it's wrong, it's, we can't feel it. It's, it's, you know. and, and then we go into, on top of the anger is our, our addictions. Yeah. Or you could say these are really our addictions too, couldn't you? 
But right up the top of all of that is numb or where many men go, intellect only. In other words, they only stay in their intellect and what they believe to be logical. Now, in unravelling all of that, obviously is going to create, we're going to need to deal with anger and as an emotion. Our belief systems about our expectations. Then our expectations need to be dealt with. And then our beliefs about our fears need to be dealt with. And then our fears need to be dealt with. And then our beliefs about our grief need to be dealt with. And then our grief will be dealt with. Now, a lot of this happens a lot more seamlessly than what I've written there. In other words, it happens quite naturally, like a child would do it when you become like a child. But the reality is that when you get to the processing of numb, when you get into numb, you really have beliefs about fears that are shutting you down. And now you're, you're in this upper level up here, way, away, way away from causal emotion. Now, from this point onwards... Spirits can manipulate your process. All right. So any time I choose to not feel my fear, a spirit is going to manipulate my fear. Any time I choose to not feel my anger, a spirit is going to manipulate my anger. Any time I try to hold on to a false belief, a spirit is going to manipulate my false belief. Any time I hold on to false beliefs about my anger, my fear, my beliefs about, uh, my, even my beliefs about grief, anything that's false can be manipulated. This is what I mean by truthful information. Truth is essential to the process. Anything that's truth cannot be manipulated. It cannot be manipulated by a person. It cannot change something. They can't manipulate you. And they can't manipulate you to be oppressed by their feelings of fear. So my suggestion for yourself, Christina, is to, is to stop focusing so much on this attempt to feel these emotions and just begin where you are feeling these emotions. Does that make sense? So, so in other words, if I try to feel this emotion when I have these still in play, I am better off going to those first and that will unlock this other process. But if I try and skip over that, which I can sometimes do, what I'll finish up doing is skipping over a whole, whole heap of false beliefs and a whole heap of fears that I still have in me that still need to be released from me at another time. And every time I try to get to grief, I'll have to go through a belief, through a false belief about my fear, then through my fear, and then through a false belief about my grief. It's far better to not have to go through a false belief because it, there's no longer exist. So what we want to do is get to the point where our belief about fear, our false beliefs about fear, no longer exist. Now I can feel my fears. And I need to get through the place where my false beliefs about grief no longer exist. Now I can feel my grief. And I need to, my false beliefs about my expectations no longer exist. Now I can feel my expectations. My false belief about anger no longer exists. Now I can feel my anger. And what I, what I put to you is that the false belief that you have is about your fear, that you can't get through it, that you're going to stay in it. That, that's the false beliefs that you need to begin addressing. Does that make sense? Yeah. When you get through those false beliefs, you'll be able to feel your fear and then you won't feel numb. You'll feel fear instead. Feeling fear feels very different than numb. <laughs> it feels terrifying. <laughs> it doesn't feel numb. Right? When we feel numb, we're detuning from our fear. We're, staying, we're trying to run away from our fear. That's why we feel numb. Yep. Okay. Um, my question is a clarification about spirit influence and the process of understanding what's actually taking place in your mind. Yep. Um, so... In one moment, I was experiencing a lot of spirit influence and I had this, what I felt was a realization that if this was really true, what I was learning from your teachings, that actually all these thoughts and external thoughts, which I tend to reject as the stupidity of my mind, are spirit influence. Mm -hmm. And if I accept and understand it in that way and observe it, then I, I suddenly felt like I was sovereign in my being. Yes. And that this was true, yep. 
all I needed now was to become more attuned at discerning the spirit influence yes. and what it was. Yes. And this brings me to something I wish to ask in relating to these um, possibly false belief systems which come from, I don't know, from what I've gathered, the sixth sphere relating to our spirituality and understanding all these things in terms of the mind. Yep. And um, so this, in fact, is a fallacy, this concept that there's a mind that we're all determined by. It doesn't take into, into an understanding that these are spirit influences. Um, do you say, you're saying the mind external to yourself? Um, I'm talking about one that you might, if you were practicing yoga and you were working on controlling the mind and evolving and reaching liberation through control of the mind. Yes. Um, and some, a lot of my questions have been around this because I've been in a very deep belief system of that and yep. then coming to a new realization. Yes. So I'm just trying to discern where so these most, things So most Buddhist begin. systems and most New Age systems, which are based on a lot of the Buddhist uh, and Hindu belief systems, are all saying that the mind needs to become dominant. In other words, you, you, the dominance of the mind is essential for spiritual enlightenment. Um, I don't believe that the mind has to be dominant at all. In fact, the reality is, is as you progress through the dimensions in the existence, in the, in the, in the spirit world, the sixth dimension, which is the place where the mind is the most dominant, right, the sixth sphere or the sixth dimension, is the furthest point you can progress to with your mind. Right? That's the furthest point. The reality is there's at least another 15 dimensions above there, but you'll never get to them with your mind. You can't. You have to get to them through the development of your soul, which is a totally different thing than the spirit body's mind. So let's clarify the mind. You've got your physical body and its brain. You've then got the spirit's body, the spirit body, which is your own spirit body, and its mind. So that's where the mind is. This is just the brain. That's why a person can have some kind of brain damage and then the brain repairs itself and then they remember what was in their mind because the mind is in another location. It's not in their physical body, right? So the mind's in the spirit body. And then you have the soul, which has a mind of its own, actually. And the soul itself has a different, completely different way of thinking, if you could use the term, because its way of thinking is feeling. So, so when you're in the soul, you, really, you actually think by feeling in your soul. No, it's not. So it's very, very different. So what happens with uh, most of the New Age philosophies and the Buddhist philosophy and the Hindu philosophy is they're teaching that the mind is the way to enlightenment. The mind is the way to grow. But the mind is actually only a part of this spirit body which actually could disappear because we don't need it just like we don't need the physical body in order to exist as a soul. Right? So in the end, this mind has to disappear. It has to go away. And therefore, our mind dominance has to disappear. We have to start having a soul dominance in our life rather than a mind dominance. Now, the, mind, the soul is still very logical. Don't, don't misunderstand that it's not logical because the soul is very logical. It's always logical, in fact. It's far more logical than the mind, right? actually. See, the mind is like a, it's like a computer central processing unit. It just responds to the stimuli. You give it the wrong stimuli, you give it the wrong information, and the mind will do all sorts of things with it. The soul can't do that. The soul is far more clever than that. And this is where if our soul is connected to God's soul, our soul, in fact, now becomes very clever because now we're channeling, if you like, feelings and the mind, we're channeling the mind of God or we're channeling the soul of God to our own soul. So now our, our soul is very clever, can understand everything in that space. The problem with the, the uh, Buddhist philosophies, if you like, which, of which most New Age teachings are based on, is this mind dominance was done to avoid the process of emotional processing. It was done to get you away from the pain of your own emotions. Whereas what I'm saying is we need to feel the pain of our own emotions because our pain of our own emotions doesn't exist there, neither does it exist there. The pain of our own emotions is actually in this part of us, here. That's where our pain is. That's where our soul-based emotional pain exists. 
And unless we release it, we can never, ever be completely free of it. We can use our intellect as much as we like to deny it, and many spirits in the sixth dimension have done this, including Buddha himself, but they are not going to progress beyond that dimension without having the soul develop rather than the mind. And the seventh dimension is an interesting dimension because the seventh dimension is where you give up the mind. When I say that, I mean you give up the mind's dominance of your life completely. And you now do everything based on the soul. You don't think about what you say even anymore. It just flows out of you. Uh, you don't have to go, oh, that question meant this and that question meant that, so that, the answer to that is this and so forth, and then you say that. You know, it's nothing like that. It just flows out. It, it's a bit like you, you, you see some child prodigies pick up a musical instrument, <coughs> never played a musical instrument in their life. It just flows out of them. They're obviously not using their mind, because if it was a mind, they would have had to learn something to do it. Does that make sense? So they're using their soul. Or in the case of many of them, they, they're channeling the soul of another person who's learnt. Um, now, the key with this development of the mind development is that it has limitations. And the greatest limitation is that you will never, ever be at one with God using that form of development. So when people talk about enlightenment, and I've had many emails recently from people who, who've heard about the divine truth because of the media, <coughs> and they've said to me, you are basically teaching the same things that Buddha is teaching. I'm sorry, I'm definitely not teaching the same things that Buddha is teaching. Because Buddha was teaching that the way to enlightenment was through the mind. And I am definitely not saying that. Because I, I know, I, I've seen Buddha, he's here in this sixth dimension and he cannot progress beyond that point while he's this mind dominant. So when people say that they're in a state of liberation, what dimension are they actually in? You mean people on earth or in the spirit world? Uh, people on earth who say they've attained a state of liberation. I feel they've attained a state of self-delusion. Mm -hmm. And that, that generally they're overcloaked by another, by a most high level most definitely being who is facilitating that experience of some kind of taste of enlightenment. Yeah, yeah. If, you, if you look at many of them, many of them have written a... Uh, like, for instance, what was his name, Dalen? Da David Hawkins? Um, yeah. He's uh, written a book, right, describing his own emotional process of feeling enlightened. And what he describes is exactly spirit overcloaking. Mm -hmm. And every single person I've ever met, actually who's described enlightenment on the earth, have all been overcloaked. I've, I've recently spoken to a group of spirits who were, a part, who were a part of the oneness movement on the earth, right? Many of you might have heard of that movement. The group of spirits, a part of the oneness movement, um, believed that they were enlightened, like they, they were at one with God, was what they called the term. I have, I've since talked to the leaders of the movement who are now in the third sphere. They were in the sixth, but they went back to the third to learn some things, and they've probably progressed since then because I haven't spoken to them for the last year or so. But, but they had to go through many emotions that they had denied to get to the point of the sixth dimension through their mind. Mm -hmm. So they had heavily suppressed their true emotional feelings. And when they started to allow them, they started having many feelings come up which meant they went back to the third sphere and allowed themselves to feel those feelings. Mind dominance has a lot of danger in it, in that uh, the mind is totally incapable of understanding matters of the soul. So in other words, it's totally un 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 incapable of understanding this soul, your own soul. <laughs> it's also totally under incapable of understanding the soul of God. It's totally un incapable of feeling the feelings that God feels. It's only the soul that's capable of feeling those feelings. And remember, there's a soul union process where the other half of the soul joins you. Mm -hmm. And that happens at the soul level, not at the mind level. Right? So it has a severe limitation even on the soulmate relationship, which is a soul-based relationship. So, so the mind will never help you be at one with God. It will never help you be at one with your soulmate. And on top of that, it has huge limitations in terms of progression. 
you can't progress beyond the sixth dimension without releasing the mind as the do as the dominant part of your controlling force. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? That makes sense. I just have a question about if you are experiencing being overcloaked by a spirit which is of a, it feels like it's a spiritual experience, as in you feel the experience in your soul. Yep. You d that's actually not happening in your soul, or it is? And is this a state of fascination which is generated from those dimensions, or how does it work? Um, what your soul is attracting is a spirit who wishes to overcloak. And what your s soul is attracting is a desire to be overcloaked, if you are. And you've got to look at the reason why you would be desiring that. Most, for most of us, it's a desire to get away from our life in some way, to get away from our day-to-day -day mundane life. When you are actually living in your own soul without a desire to be overcloaked or anything else, you will live passionately in your own day-to-day -day life. You will not be looking externally for someone or something to give you a feeling in order to live passionately in your life. The problem for many is that we have a strong desire to avoid our life because we feel sad about it or annoyed with it or frustrated with it and so forth. And almost every person I know who's had a spiritual enlightenment position or rather, it would be better to say, they've been overcloaked by a spirit who's been attracted to them, has been, that attraction has been caused by them having a desire to get away from their own life in some way, to avoid their own life. So what I would do is I would always suggest to the person to go back to the point when they felt the feeling the first time and what feelings were they having just before then. Now, for most people, they, have feel they were having feelings of terrible despondency and despair before then. And that was the reason why they wanted to get out of their own life. And that is also the reason why somebody else came in and helped them enjoy their life again from a spirit world. So there is always a soul-based emotional reason why a person becomes attracted to certain groups of spirits and why a sixth dimensional spirit or less in the, but on the natural love path would be attracted to the soul of such a person. My suggestion is when you want to connect with God, you realise that God is never going to overcloak you. You will get to a point of at one minute with God, but even in that state, you will be very individual. Your individuality, in fact, is much more powerful in that state than any other state uh, below it. So the reality is you're not absorbed by the mind of God, but rather the, your soul becomes more of an individual at one with God's feelings. In other words, in agreement with God's feelings. It has the same feelings God has about all these different issues. And that is a very different state than a person being overcloaked and the mind or the feelings of a spirit affecting the person and making them feel euphoric feelings. That state is more like a drug-induced state. And the, the sad part about it is I've seen many hundreds of thousands, millions of people in fact over my life who have been in the state of being overcloaked, thinking that it's themselves at one with God and then passing passing into a state in the first sphere and being totally and utterly distraught about how could they be in this condition when they didn't feel that condition when they were on earth. The reality is a spirit who's overcloaking a person on earth can no longer overcloak the person when they're in the spirit world. And so now the person is forced to feel themselves, themselves that they were avoiding. And that, that is a very harsh reality for many of these people to face. Many of the Indian gurus pass in this state. Just recently, um, Sai Baba passed. He passed in that state. He visited us. We, we have some friends who were personally connected to Sai Baba. He visited us, expressing his severe disappointment with his passing. Because he didn't pass into the sixth dimension. He passed into the first. Uh, and it's because of the spirits who were overcloaking him that uh, he had that experience, really. Plus his own desire to avoid the truth. So how can you discern when you, when you may have a spirit influence which seems to be like it's coming from God and if it isn't God? Does it talk to you? Um, well, sometimes I feel they sort of live through me slightly. Well, if, it's, if you have a feeling that something's living through you, then it's not God. Because God never lives through anyone. 
Yeah. Right? If you have a feeling that, uh, that it's talking to you, or you know that it's talking to you, then it's not God. Because God doesn't talk to anyone like that. Because God transmits feeling to feeling, soul to soul. In, into your own soul, so you'd feel it flowering through yourself. Yeah, but, yeah. but you become more of an individual, not less of one. Do you, do you understand? You yeah. become more yourself, not less of yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of pointers, and perhaps we should have a long discussion at some point as to all the different pointers that indicate overcloaking. But, uh, and particular overcloaking from a spirit who's, who's got a good degree of development. Yeah. But that, these are some of them. Yeah. I, I get quite uh, sad still sometimes watching these people pass. Because uh, they pass and their, their level of distress is heightened by the fact of the contrast of what they experienced on earth compared to what they're now experiencing in the spirit world. They, they experience very poor entry into the spirit world with a lot of distress when on earth they felt very happy with themselves and very content and they felt they were God. Like in Sai Baba's case, Phil, he's, he was God. And uh, when they pass, they arrive in the first dimension in quite a lot of darkness and it's very, very distressing. Do they not remain in denial for the system that still exists in all those other dimensions that supported them all through that experience? Uh, yeah, a lot of times they do remain in denial for a, so, for a very long time. Because if those exist in the other dimensions, then surely they would just pass into another aspect of it. Or it's not... No, case. it's not like that. Your soul, remember, goes to your place of development. If your place of development of your soul is in the first, that's where you will go. And many times then the six fear spirits or the higher spirits who were overcloaking you come to visit you and explain to you what they did. But as you can imagine, the emotions that you feel towards them are not very pleasant. Right? Because you feel like your entire life was taken over. Many six fear spirits and, and, and spirits lower on the natural life path have a strong feeling they're helping you. So they feel, I'm helping the person. I'm making their life better. You know, the spirits who overcloak Sai Baba's still feel they made Sai Baba's life better. Right? They have no remorse about their actions. And in reality, it was an action that he encouraged. So, so in the end, he can't very well blame them for something that he desired. Right? But it is sad to see that when the results occur, that's the sad thing. Whereas someone like Gandhi, totally different totally different condition. He was very much in his own self, very much connected with himself. When he passed, he passed in re relatively good condition in comparison to most people on the earth. And he had a very strong desire for truth, progressed very rapidly on the divine love path. You know, he, he didn't uh, care whether it was a Jesus teaching or not. You know, he had none of those uh, predispositions towards, towards Christianity. And he found the divine love path very, very rapidly as a result of his love for truth. Very different passing. He had, he had one of the best passings any person on the planet, aside from myself, has had. And even though he was brought up in the same cu culture, the same country, as Sai Baba. Mm. Okay. Um, I've already discussed that many times. I won't answer that again. It's in, in some of the DVDs. I think it's time to have a finish now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So uh, our next meeting, we're not sure still whether it will be here uh, Wednesday night or not. We, we've got to contact some people tomorrow about that. So um, we hope that it will be here. If you rock up here and you find it's not here, then it's not very far to where it will be, which is over, over in the... Uh, probably downstairs at... at Katarina is outside, so you might want to bring an umbrella with you, perhaps. Um, so, so we'll meet there at four on Wednesday, and uh, and then it will be back here Saturday and Sunday at one thirty for those that are still around, and we'll have some more talks back here. Okay. We'll. Myself and Mary would like to thank you for the donations we received yesterday and today. 
and uh, and a lot of the and those of you who have not yet got your DVDs, but you're not from Greece, so those of you who are from another country but have not yet got your DVDs, they are over at the back on that corner there. If you just feel free to take them when you go home, Is that all right? Thank you. We'll catch you Wednesday.